There's a new visitor centre on Beacon Fell. It's a vast improvement over the old one, which was basically a hut full of dead flies. The new one sells food and drink and guidebooks and frogs on springs. Although it wouldn't sell my paintings for some reason. The old one housed a lonely visitor's log, half buried beneath a mound of insects' corpses. The log was full of complaints about the dead blue bottles. The new centre appears to have refocused the whole fell. Time was when the slope it now occupies used to overflow in the summer with anemic sunbathers. Listening to their radios at full blast, their radish-headed children kicking footballs about and screaming wildly. The rest of Beacon Fell was ignored. We couldn't help wondering why they didn't just stay at home, really. Nowadays, however, it's all ramblers with thick woolen socks turned over their boots, backpacks, ordnance survey maps, bobble hats, and digital SLRs. A Zardos-like carved stone head that looks a bit constipated watches over them ominously. They introduced Thomas Dagnall's sculptures to Beacon Fell some years ago. What was once Lancashire's favourite dogging location was transformed overnight into a cultural event. There used to be a large carved bat suspended from the treetops by chains in the copse further up. It's gone now, and so have all our photographs of it, apparently. Scattered randomly throughout the woods, however, are a snake carved from a tree trunk, a mutant crocodile, what appears to be an ostrich with its head buried in the earth, and various other ingenious creations. They're really rather good. As its name suggests, Beacon Fell had a beacon on it once, as long ago as 1002, before William the Bastard invaded. One of a long line of beacons, stretching all the way from Priestall round to Warbreck. These were our first line of defence, warning of invaders such as the Spanish in 1588 and the French in 1795. Nowadays, a trigonometry point, topped by a diagram detailing the various visible peaks, occupies the summit. There's Parlick Pike, which has a clough, pronounced clue, apparently. An enormous gouge in its side, which irresistibly draws ramblers to peer over the edge and into the fathomless drop. From its summit, the successful climber can look down on parachutists and gliders. Then there's Fair Snape, Snape being the old word for pasture, Saddlefell and Bleasdale. Unexploded bombs are said to lurk amongst those peaks. Leftovers from the military training exercises that took place up there during the Second World War. It's good to see Beacon Fell being respected now, although it would appear the odd nutter still manages to slip through. In 2014, the police noticed a suspicious looking gentleman in the car park brandishing a crossbow. Cautiously, they backed away before engaging in a fast-paced pursuit along the winding lanes. Eventually, the would-be William Tell found himself cornered on the M55, where he climbed out of his car and promptly shot himself in the head. Incredibly, he missed, or at any rate failed, to deliver the killing blow. That's what happens if your head is solid meat. It takes all sorts to make a world, but some sorts are best off left out. There's also the odd paranormal occurrence of Beacon Fell, as you might expect, such as the not very big foot. During our researches for this film, we came across an article in which a lady had discovered a strange footprint on one of the slopes. In her own words, I found what I think is a print on a recent outing. Myself and my partner went for a walk on Beacon Fell last weekend, and we came across this. I'm not too sure what to think of it. There does seem to be a heel impression on what looks like a big toe. Evidence of a baby yeti, perhaps? Or just a reminder, as mentioned a few moments ago, that Beacon Fell was once a popular dogging destination. Whatever the case, it's onwards to Chipping, which is at least a thousand years old, and at one time sported seven mills along the banks of Chipping Brook. The last of these was Kirk Mill, 
a chair-making factory that went bankrupt in 2010. The village was originally called Chippenden, meaning marketplace, rather than anything to do with male strippers. The craft centre in Chipping has served longer as a shop, apparently, than any other building in Britain, apparently. It was opened in 1668 by a local wool merchant, and has since served as an undertaker's, a post office, a tea shop, and a craft centre. I wonder if the Guinness Book of Records knows. How about a ghost story? Tough, because you're getting one anyway. The Sun Inn dates back to the 17th century. That's between 1600 and 1699 for anybody who gets confused about such matters. It's haunted by the ghost of Lizzie Dean. Lizzie was the scullery maid. In 1835, she fell head over heels, quite literally it would appear, for a local lad, who, true to form, asked her somewhat mendaciously to marry him, just so that he could have his wicked way with her. Being a bit naive, Lizzie fell for his ruse, hook, line and sinker. Once he'd fulfilled his conquest, he dumped her quicker than the Lib Dems dumped their egalitarian policies when they got into government. To make matters worse, he then proposed to her best mate, who, also being a big thick, agreed. On the day of the wedding at St Bartholomew's, Guy Fawkes night apparently, the heartbroken Lizzie climbed into the attic at the Sun Inn and hung herself. She left a note which read, I want to be buried at the entrance to the church, so that my lover and my best friend will always have to walk past my grave whenever they go to church. Nose, face, spite, whatever, Lizzie got her wish. Her grave can be found near the old church entrance, although her ghost has often been seen wandering around the Sun Inn in a colourful dress, making noises and moving items around without pay. A bit like work experience. Enough. Please click like, leave a comment if it's not too insulting, and subscribe to our channel. And we'll be back again soonest with more Lancashire footnotes.